It's a great grace indeed that we can come together to rejoice in prayer, in vibrant song, and now reflection for the beautiful gift that the family is to the life of the social community and certainly to the church. As St. John Paul II once wrote, the way of the church passes through the family. And as I hope at least most of you know, among the priorities of the Archdiocese in this year and for a few years to come is that of strengthening marriages and families. And already tonight, we have been inspired to do just that. By providential design, we have the long-awaited visit of the Cardinal Archbishop of Manila to our Archdiocesan family. And it's on the feast of the solemnity of St. Joseph, the protector of the Holy Family and of our family. Those of you who were at Holy Rosary Cathedral for Mass earlier today heard the, ca the Cardinal's homily on St. Joseph. Joseph, who cared so lovingly for Jesus and Mary, a model of fatherhood for all of us. I'm grateful, and I want to express this, indeed to add to Pavel's remarks, I want to express my sincere gratitude for the many, many people working together with Deacon Greg, who put together tonight, but the whole event. To me, it's a wonderful and beautiful sign of the communion of a church which, when it works together, is indeed able to accomplish, as Mother Teresa once said, something beautiful for God. But now it's my great pleasure to introduce, of course, this evening's keynote speaker, the reason for our gathering today, Cardinal Luis Antonio, but more commonly known as Chito Tagle. Inside, inside the program, you, you can see a short biography of the Cardinal, so there's no need for me to go into all the details. But I would point out that he spent several years in North America in Washington, D.C., studying theology at the Catholic University of America. He also subsequently served on the, as a member of the International uh, Theological Commission and on the Commission for Doctrine of the Catholic Bishops' Conference of the Philippines. The list of his responsibilities for the Holy See make him a frequent visitor to Rome. And I hope that on one of these other visits, you'll pop by Vancouver again, Your Eminence. <laughs> and in Rome, he serves on many bodies which uh, assist Pope Francis in his ministry to the church around the world. He's a member, for example, of the Congregation for Catholic Education, Evangelization of Peoples, the Pontifical, one time the Pontifical Council of the Family, Pastoral Care of Migrants and Itinerant People, the Congregation for uh, Con Institutes of Consecrated Life and Societies of Apostolic Life, and now the Pontifical Council of the Laity, a long list. But while he's a distinguished and even great theologian, he has an ability to share that knowledge in a way which touches the heart as well as instructs the mind. It has been said of him, and I quote, Tagli is a man of the gospel who knows how to talk 
about Jesus Christ because he knows him. The Cardinal was ordained a priest in 1982. He served in, as a pastor, an assistant in many parishes. On for his Mass of Thanksgiving after ordination, he celebrated on a Sunday, perhaps also the Saturday evening, an amazing total of nine Masses. <laughs> Beyond belief. <laughs> Just telling what I read. <laughs> he was installed as the Archbishop of Manila on December the 12th, 2011, the feast, of course, of Our Lady of Guadalupe, and it also marked his own 10th anniversary of ordination as Bishop of Imus. The following year, it was Pope Benedict who named him a cardinal. Cardinal Tagli is known to most of you. He's known, above all, as a priest and a bishop who accompanies his people in their daily struggles of life. No doubt that's why he was chosen to head Caritas Internationalis. Tonight, he is addressing us on keeping families, our families, in faith, in our faith. We welcome you, Cardinal Chito, with our hearts, and we keenly look forward to your talk on the domestic church of the family in an increasingly globalized world. The microphone is yours. And welcome, welcome. Oh. Thank you. It looks like the end of the talk already. <laughs> oh, oh, why did you sit down? Please remain standing. <laughs> okay. Well, we, we thank God for gathering us as one big family of faith. We thank God for choosing Vancouver for this wonderful gathering. And I would like to thank again our dear Archbishop Michael for his patience and persistence in uh, inviting me. And now I, I, I have no regrets. I should be here, and I hope one day I could come back here to be with you. And if you get tired waiting for my return, you can always go to Manila, <laughs> and we can meet there. You know, the, uh, I was not expecting something like this. I thought I would be giving a talk to 200, 300 pious <laughs> people <laughs> who have attended all the recollections available in the diocese. You know. But then having this gathering in uh, this great hall, and then you have people up there close to the heavens. <laughs> and then you have those there in purgatory. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, yeah. You see where it is happiest <laughs> on earth. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm overwhelmed and I am humbled, really humbled. And the presentation before our short break really uh, was a temptation to me. I, I was tempted to say, I don't need to give this talk. <laughs> what else, what else do I have to say? Some of the deepest things in life should not be said 
They should be sung. They should be danced. And we are drawn to the beauty, the beauty of humanity and the beauty of the gospel. Who did not want to sing with them? Who did not want to cry with them? Who did not want to jump with them? Who did not want to be part of their family a while ago? I used to belong to a group like that when I was much younger. <laughs> and I thank God in silence for that group. And most of them came from the slums of Manila. They were the group that through song and dance evangelized so many people. Strengthening the family in faith, keeping the family in faith. But I think we also need to address the reverse. Keeping faith in the family. Some don't believe anymore in the value of family. And so how can they keep the family in faith, in our Christian faith, if they themselves do not have faith anymore in marriage and in family life? If we want to address the complex issues involved in this theme, I, need, we need, I think we need to reserve this hall for a full month. But you have to go to work and you have your families to feed. So I won't pretend to be able to give you a complete synthetic approach to the theme, I would set for myself a modest goal. I just want to tickle your imagination. <laughs> I would like to tickle your mind and your heart, and hopefully you go home with questions and with the zeal that evangelizers, the first apostles, felt when they when their hearts were burning, and they would go home, not with an idea, but with an experience. We have seen the Lord. We have seen the Lord. And so what we have seen, have heard and touched, we in turn share with you. The family. Yes, the family is a sociological, a cultural phenomenon. But for us, in the Judeo-Christian tradition, it is part of God's plan. It is part of God's design for creation, for humanity, and for the history of the world. From the very beginning, from Genesis, we see how God's creative love involved a family, a man and a woman, looking at each other, and the man exclaiming, at last, bones of my bones, flesh of my flesh. Husbands, when you wake up in the morning and you see your wife, do you say, at last, <laughs> bones of my bones, flesh of my flesh? Or do you say, alas, <laughs> what has befallen me? <laughs> but it was not that way at the beginning. 
And God always created renewed families and involved families in God's covenant relationship with his people. The family of Abraham, family of Isaac, Israel, Joseph, his brothers. God loved families. And one image that God uses in order to bring to Israel's attention the depth of God's covenant relationship is that of marriage, is that of family life. And in the fullness of time, which is also the fullness of love, God sent his son. He became human. But part of being human is to be born into a family. So the incarnation involved also God touching this very human sociological and cultural phenomenon and transforming it into an event that is considered the fullness of time. But the Bible is realistic. When we look at the genealogy of Jesus, oh, before Christmas, you have this long reading with all those strange names. That was the family of Jesus. And how God prepared for the coming of Jesus with such a long, long line of families. But not all of them were good and righteous. The patriarchs, yeah, wow, Abraham and all of those people. But how come Esau, who was cheated, was not mentioned? And the cheater was mentioned. <laughs> and then you have women mentioned. But the women who were mentioned were all outsiders, Rahab, even a prostitute, Ruth, an outsider. And then the closest to the birth of Christ were the unknown people. Even historians could not establish the identity of those people. No wonder when Jesus was born and he started his ministry, he had a heart for the broken. He had a heart for women of ill repute. He had a heart for the outcasts and the outsiders. They were part of his family. The Bible is very realistic. I think even God would have approved of our theme. How do we keep the families in faith? And how do we keep faith in family? God would have said, that was my concern too. <laughs> and that is my concern up to now. Thank you <laughs> for uh, making it your own. We know the forces and the factors that in a way undermine faith in the families and families in keeping their faith. 
poverty is the cause of so much you know, exploitation. Some parents sell their children online. Sexual exploitation online. How could a mother do that? But some of them with tears, bitter tears, say, I need to feed my child. Because of poverty, you have forced migration. You have a mother working in Hong Kong, a father working in Qatar, the children living in Manila, Even without divorce, they are de facto separated from one another. Not because they hate each other, but because they love one another. One Filipina whom I met in northern Italy told me, that every time she prepared the meals of the two Italian children that she was taking care of, she asked herself, who is preparing the meals of my children back home? This is the daily crucifixion of an overseas mother worker. But then, with a smile, she told me, but when I look at these two beautiful Italian children, I promise I will give them the love that I want my children to experience. What heroism. But then what pain also. We have international conflicts, wars, natural disaster, producing a lot of refugees, separating people from their loved ones. In a refugee camp in Greece, I saw the refugees from Syria, Iraq, even Sudan, coming in families. But then I noticed one boy, he was alone. So I asked him, where are you from? He said, Syria, Syria. He said, where are your parents, father, mother? In Syria. He said, why? Why are they in Syria, you alone? He said, parents said, go, go. Once in a while, his face flashes to my memory. And I wonder, where is he now? How are his parents? Will they meet again? Social communications. What a blessing. But then, children would rather look at their cell phone than at their father. They have time for infinite chatting, but their social skills, relational skills, might be suffering. But what is family? Family is relationship. But they say texting is the new way of relating. 
But if you are in front of me, please do not text to me. <laughs> Why can you not tell me good morning? Why do you have to send it by text? What's wrong with my presence? Maybe next time I will come to you dressed up like a mobile phone. <laughs> And through social communications, some worldviews, some of them even contrary to our gospel values and some traditional cultural values, are absorbed by the present generation almost uncritically. These are just a few. But then, we say, in the midst of all that, we have our faith. Our faith. There are many ways to describe the faith. But for our purposes, I just want to say that fundamentally, faith is God's gift. We cannot produce faith. It is a gift that we should beg the Lord to give us. But at the same time, it requires a response. In the end, faith is a relationship that God wants to have with us. And it is part of our freedom to say yes to God. Faith is a gripping experience of someone who has loved me unconditionally someone who has offered everything for me and I respond by abandoning myself to God that encounter with God in Jesus Christ and in the gift of the Holy Spirit this is nurtured and mediated to us by the Word of God. Faith comes from hearing. So, dear families, what is the place of the Word of God in your family life? Do you even have a Bible? Don't answer. Every Christmas, every birthday, we're thinking what to give, what to give. Does the Bible even enter our minds? The sacraments. And the sacraments are events of God. God present through symbols and rites giving us grace at every moment of our lives, every stage of our lives. Unfortunately, some of the sacraments are being reduced to cultural events. They complain about the faith formation. No, too long. Why three weeks? Why six months? But it takes them one year looking for their gown looking for the best restaurant. But what is, a, what is marriage? Is it a fashion show? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then we complain. How come the family is not able to keep the faith? Because from the very beginning, marriage was the faith central. Or was it, oh... What's the first dance? No. And then the wedding coordinators, you know, the wedding planners. You know, I had even one experience. We were 45 minutes late already. So I, I called the groom. I said, is the bride already there? He said, yes. The other members of the entourage, are they there? Yes. So what's keeping us? He said, Bishop, Please talk to the wedding planner. 
<laughs> imagine. <laughs> so the wedding planner came to me and said, yes, Bishop? I said, hey, I don't have the whole afternoon. I have another mass. Why have we not started? Everyone is there. He said, but we're waiting for the butterflies, she said. <laughs> said, butterflies? I said, yes. When the bride starts processing, we will release the butterflies. I said, what has that to do with the faith? <laughs> and you spend a lot of money on that. And remotely, remotely connected to the faith. I don't even know if it is legal to uh, catch those butterflies just to be released. And then I said, but we should start. He said, Bishop, I am the wedding planner. <laughs> so I stood up and said, I happen to be the official witness of the church. So I ran to the, uh, the altar area and I said, let the, the procession begin. But the organist was not there. I did it. Dan, dan, daran, dan, dan, daran. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> There's no electric organ. I have my throat. <laughs> I can produce the sound. <laughs> but really, you wonder, why is the family not keeping faith? But let us review. Baptism, is it an event of faith? Or is it simply a social event. And we take, for example, a witnesses, sponsors, not among the family members anymore, but we choose the mayor. <laughs> we choose the, <laughs> the richest businessman and everything. <laughs> and so what is it? Is the baptism now, is baptism now a fundraising event? <laughs> is it a power trip? You're laughing, I'm angry. <laughs> and then service, the service of charity, the word of God, sacraments, serving, because the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. And then we say, as an excuse, charity, begins at home. Yes, it begins at home, but it must get out. <laughs> it begins there, but it should not stay there. It should not stop there. Ah. <laughs> God wants to nurture God's relationship with us called faith. God offers us the opportunity to encounter him in his word, in his sacraments, in his service. And hopefully, through our constancy in listening to the word of God, in celebrating God's presence, active presence in the sacraments, by participating in God's love for humanity, the faith, will be internalized. The relationship with God is internalized and it becomes a worldview. So that I may not be in church, but I live according to the faith. I may not be in the chapel, I might be in school, I might be in my workplace, but my mind, my heart, my ears have been trained by the word of God by the presence of God in the sacraments, and by the love that I see other people sharing with one another. And so my perspective, my horizon, is that of faith. It can happen. <laughs> it can happen that I do not as for the grace, and I don't exert the effort to internalize the relationship called faith. 
So, for example, during consecration, no? as the sacred host is shown to the people, some are very pious. They're already kneeling down, they still bow, and they hit, they strike their breast no? louder than the, the bells. <laughs> the bird, no? And then they will say, my Lord, my God. And then the communion time comes. No? He or she returns to the seat and finds someone already seated there. What are you doing here? Get out. Get out. Uh, 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 where is the reverence? You just spit your, your past, and now you're kicking people around. Where's the faith perspective? But this is a, a, a journey. Why are you laughing? Aha. Uh, uh. uh -huh. We see ourselves. <laughs> you know, I don't attack frontally. I make people laugh. And then we realize we're laughing at ourselves. And then you will get angry with me when you reach home. <laughs> There's that cardinal. Uh, okay. May I be given now a, a time to illustrate what I've been saying. Again, not in a comprehensive manner, but I want to focus on a few things. First, how the faith, the certainty that Jesus is with us, that Jesus is risen from the dead, that God is triumphant over sin and death, that faith, that faith which is not just professed and celebrated sporadically or once in a while, but has become. Now, my perspective in life and my vision in life affecting my speech, my view of people, my view of events, and my relationships. This is important when we experience difficulties in life, especially within the family. I realized that many times we look at difficulties in life as problems. And because we see them as problems, our approach is find a solution. That's what a problem needs, a solution. But try to examine daily life, especially family life. Very few problems there, very few. Most of them are not problems, but dilemmas. And what is a dilemma? A dilemma is a problem that does not go away. <laughs> Husbands, <laughs> is your wife a problem or a dilemma? <laughs> Wives, your husbands, are they a problem or a dilemma? <laughs> I'm joking. When I was younger, they said, there was a song in The Sound of Music, how do you solve a problem like Maria? But is Maria a problem? <laughs> She's a mystery. <laughs> but some people will say she is a dilemma. How do you deal with dilemmas? You don't propose solutions. You tell stories. Right now. Right now. <laughs> stories. 
stories of people, of families, who have gone through those difficulties, but have survived gracefully. Those scarred, they remain strong. And then you wonder, why? Why do they remain strong? Why do they continue persevering? And then you will discover there is a story of faith woven into the lives of those families. It is the faith that gives them a sense of meaning. It is the faith that makes them see in a difficult person, in a difficult relationship, still the presence of God. Without faith, how do you look at sickness? Without faith, how do you look at the death of a mother a few hours before the graduation of a, son, of a daughter? And we need those stories. As the world focuses on the problems that do not have solutions, as the world focuses on the stories of gloom, the faith enables us to see another type of story. The stories of valor, the stories of perseverance and strength, which is not a product of human effort alone. But those stories need to be told. Stories of faith, of meaning, of love. Ah. When your child starts appearing like a dilemma, remember stories. Last month, I celebrated my 36th anniversary of ordination to the priesthood. And my mother wrote to me, she's turning 88. No, my father turned 88 last January. And uh, she wrote to me and said, oh yeah, congratulating me. And I said, but I always have a mixed feeling of joy and sadness when I remember you were three years old then and you woke up, you told me, Inai, nagugutom ako. <laughs> Mom, I'm hungry. I don't know why my mother remembers that. I don't know why she tells me that over and over again. And I don't know why it generates in her both joy and sadness. I don't know if she looks at me and sees how busy I am, how thin I am, <laughs> How, uh, how I lose sleep and, uh, uh, and I wonder whether in her incapacity to help me, she just needed to tell the story, not only for me, but for herself, to assure her that that hungry boy of three years is now 60 years old. Don't worry, don't worry. <laughs> he will have many hungers, but don't worry, don't worry. When you see your husband like a dilemma, remember stories, and you will be 
rejuvenated. <laughs> That's a suggestion. <laughs> Stories nurtured by faith. Another element that is part of our faith, and this is related even to Pope Francis's Laudato Si uh, encyclical on caring for our common home. And Pope Francis says there that while we care for the earth, our common home, we should also care for human beings, environmental ecology, and human ecology must come together. And that is part of faith, the vision that God is the creator. And everything and everyone, all are gifts. The moment the horizon of gift, nurtured by faith, provided by faith, disappears, and is replaced by another perspective, family life is one casualty. In our world today, we don't see gifts anymore in creatures and in human beings. The mindset of today is more transactional. We see things. We we see objects, we see commodities, and we gauge the value of things and persons according to their use for me. If they are useless, I throw them away. They don't look like gifts anymore. And we do that with values. We do that with human beings what Pope Francis calls the throwaway culture. But that is pride. When there is the horizon of gift, we are humble. We are just recipients of gifts. And we are stewards of gifts. You don't throw away gifts. You take care of the gifts. Caring. But if I pretend to be the owner I am a self-made man. Everything is a fruit of my achievement. Then there will be no gratitude. There will be no caring. If you serve my purposes, then I love you. But if you are a hindrance to my purposes, I discard you. At the LA Congress, I said, I experienced that too. I wonder whether I am still a human being or a commodity. When I was a deacon, going to the villages for Bible service with communion, no altar boy, no choir joined me because I was a lowly deacon. Then I became a priest. My value went up. <laughs> it became more profitable to be associated with me because after the Mass, the community fed me. So <laughs> the choir, the sacristan also want to have a bit of the food. And so Father will join you, okay. Then I became a bishop. Oh, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> it went up. So all of a sudden, the people of my hometown, all of them claimed, you are my relative. <laughs> <laughs> the market value just went up. <laughs> now, I am a cardinal. <laughs> And everyone wants to have a selfie with me. A selfie, selfie, selfie. You know, the face has not changed. Huh? It's the same face 35 years ago. But how come they're all running to have a photo with me? 
I guess my market value has risen. <laughs> Husbands, when you look at your wives, do you see a gift of God? No answer. Yeah. <laughs> Wives, when you look at your husbands, do you see a gift of God? <laughs> Not convincing. <laughs> wow. Parents, when you look at your children, what do you see? A, a problem? <laughs> problem is that, oh, a financial burden, oh, she will go to college, oh, the loans and everything. And when the mother learns, I am pregnant, will she say, a gift or will she say another problem <laughs> and then if it is a problem you discard it the elderly they are a drain to my budget they're not useful anymore. So they can be discarded. We want to keep the family strong. Let us recover that faith vision. We have God as creator, a generous God. And God also saves and recreates let us open our eyes to the many gifts, especially in the family. And when you see a gift, you care for it. You nurture it. You don't throw it away. This watch of mine has been with me since 1973. This was the gift of my parents for my high school graduation. Some people tell me, hey, Cheeto, you are a cardinal now. Discard that. There are <laughs> new watches, uh, high tech, and all of that. No, I said, but this is not just a watch for me. This is not an object. This is a gift. I know my parents worked hard to be able to give their son a gift. I don't know how many months they paid installment <laughs> just to be able to give their son a gift. I will not discard it. But it is easy for others who don't see a gift in it to say, change it, throw it away. Let us recover that faith vision, gift, grace. May I still continue? <laughs> Just two more points, and then I'll, I'll uh, liberate you. <laughs> uh -huh. But you, you don't answer. Husbands, well, <laughs> what do you see in your wife? Do you see a gift? Yeah. Why do you sound angry? Yeah. So when you go home, huh, the couples are here. You tell each other, hey, sit down there in front of me. Let us look at each other. 
And then you say, oh, wow, what a gift of God. <laughs> what a gift of God. May not be, he or she may not be perfect, but that does not eliminate the quality of being a gift. The, <laughs> so my first point is with the faith experience and faith uh, vision, we can tell stories that will inspire people to be strong when they are in situations of dilemmas. They don't just give up. Secondly, the faith vision of gift, the horizon of grace, and then our responsibility. You are a steward. You are supposed to take care of gifts. The third is well, the Paschal mystery at the center of our faith. The passion, the death of Christ, and also the resurrection, new life. One complete mystery. And that faith, vision, and experience must be kept daily in our family life, in our relationships. For me, one important biblical event was the uh, apparition of the risen Lord to his disciples according to St. John. He first appeared to them. He was able to enter, no, even if the doors were locked. He was able to cross the, the walls. No, and the disciples who were hiding because of fear, no, when you are afraid, you hide, you enclose yourself. No. But Jesus was able to penetrate showed himself, no recrimination, no, <laughs> no uh, bad word from Jesus, nothing. But Thomas was not there. And the disciples told Thomas, we have seen the Lord. And Thomas said, oh, unless I see and put my hand into his wounds, I will not believe. And then came the day, Jesus appears to them again. And Jesus tells Thomas, come. Put your finger into the wounds of my hands. And put your hand in the wound of my side. And after that, Thomas said, my Lord and my God. Touching wounds, looking at wounds, touching wounds, but with faith. We should not deny the woundedness that is in us. Let us not get angry when we see our spouse, our children, our in-laws as wounded people. All of us are wounded. But Jesus shows his wounds and invites his disciples to look and to touch. We are invited to look and to touch, to look at and to touch the wounds of our family members and in faith to see the wounds of Jesus. In faith to be able to say, my Lord, my God, you are present here in the wounds of my wife, in the wounds of my daughter, in the wounds of my child.
very often we become more judgmental when we see wounds. When in fact, in the vision of faith, it calls us to solidarity, communion, forgiveness. We can decide to remain angry, imprisoned in the walls of bitterness, resentment. But Jesus crosses those walls and liberates his disciples. He did not. I, 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 always, I always tell myself, if I were Jesus, I will really look for Peter. <laughs> and I will cross mountains, hills, and walls to find Peter. And I will say, Peter, look. Look. Look at how you have wounded me. Now tell me, do you know me? Thank God I am not Jesus. <laughs> he comes, shows his wounds, caused by his friends, friends who had failed him. And what does he say? Peace be with you. From the wounds of, of, of anger and hatred would come the grace of peace and forgiveness. Yeah. All of us are wounded. We should all know how to touch the wounds of each one. And in faith, believe that Jesus wants peace from those wounds and that he wants us to forgive. When I was younger, there was, a, there was a beautiful song. I wish they could still make songs like that, that says, a chair is still a chair, even when there's no one sitting there. But a chair is not a house, and the house is not a home when there's no one there to hold you tight, and no one there you can kiss good night. A room is still a room, even when there's nothing there but gloom. But a room is not a house, and a house is not a home when the two of us are far apart and one of us has a broken heart. Now and then, I call your name, and suddenly your face appears. But it's just a crazy game. When it ends, it ends in tears. Then the beautiful part, darling, have a heart. Don't let one mistake keep us apart. I'm not meant to live alone, turn this house into a home. When I climb the stairs and turn the key, oh, please be there, still in love with me. That's a home. There are some people with big, fabulous houses but are homeless. They don't have a home because the wounds are not touched unto forgiveness. So when you go home, as you climb the stairs and turn the key, oh, please, please be there. Huh? <laughs> Please be there, <laughs> still in love with your wounded, wounded husband, wife. And as you touch the wounds, say with Jesus, peace be with you. Peace. The one who gives peace is wounded, wounded too.
No, I had an, um, a professor, an American missionary to the Philippines, and uh, he, he, he just died, he passed away. But before he died, he asked if I could visit him. So I went to, his, uh, to the, the home for the sick Jesuits. Yeah. And uh, it was Black Saturday. So I went, when I entered the room, father started crying. He, he, was, he was like a, a child. He was sobbing. And, and the nurse told me, Every time uh, former students and friends visit father, he gets emotional. So I came close to him and started you know, stroking his shoulder and said, Father, Father, okay, it's okay, Father. You know? Obviously, he was suffering. Then the crying subsided. He looked at me and he smiled sweetly and said, Chito, oh, Chito. You used to sleep in my class. <laughs> I thought, oh, wow. So now I know the reason why he called for me. And, uh, if Jesus had his seven last words, that would be the first word <laughs> of Father. I said, Father, please, please, Father, forgive me. I said, I'm sorry if I, if I had caused you distress you know, when, when, when uh, you were teaching us. I said, no, 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 don't worry. He said, you did well, you did well. And then he said, but look at you. You are now a cardinal. No, I, I, I bore that comment in my mind, my heart, that whole day in meditation. I said, what was God communicating to me? What was Father telling me? And what I, I, I sort of heard was, Chito, do not be proud. We know you. We know you. You may be a cardinal now, but we know you. You just slept in class. <laughs> Don't be proud. Don't be proud. Don't even think that it is your achievement. You are wounded. But you are a product of God's mercy and the mercy of so many people, especially your professors. <laughs> and they were very good. They saw my wounds. But they, they trusted in God <laughs> that could heal these wounds. And so, when I see people sleeping during my homily, I, <laughs> oh, I don't bother. <laughs> I just tell myself, wow, I've slept through all my theology classes. I've done worse things. <laughs> and so let them sleep. You know, maybe an angel of God is communicating better, holier things you know, than I am able to. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. I see my wounds in them. I told this to a, a group of priests in Manila, and one of the priests <laughs> approached me and said, you know, your eminence, when I was a seminarian, I slept also in, in class. Do you think I have a chance to become a cardinal <laughs> too? Uh, that's not for me to give. <laughs> but again, no. In our world today, the most wounded, the most vulnerable, the most needy are taken advantage of. The refugees, the migrants, wow. They are already needy and vulnerable and wounded. Ah. And they become victims of smuggling. There is a 
billion dollar business that has arisen from the needs and wounds of people. That is not a family. That is not a home. For us, woundedness and vulnerability invites forgiveness, peace. And finally, mission. If we just focus on ourselves, if we just focus on the internal life of the church, we might become too self-absorbed, too narrow, and it weakens more the faith life of the community. As we said, part of the nurturance of the faith life of the family is to serve in love the way Jesus did. When we are for others in a genuine, sincere way, we become what we truly are. A family that eats together is a good family. But the family that shares food with the hungry becomes more a Christian family. A family that prays together is a good family. But the family that prays only for its own needs will become weak. After all, while Jesus extols the nuclear family, Jesus also reminds us when he was told, your mother and brothers and sisters are waiting for, looking for you outside. What did he say? Who are my mother, brothers and sisters? Those who hear the word of God and put it into practice are my mother, brothers and sisters. Jesus expands also the vision of family to include those who are searching for God, who are listening in spite of their woundedness to the word of God, and who are trying, struggling to act on the word of God. Seeing a brother, a sister in them, serving them. A family that serves themselves is good but it will be a better family of faith if it starts serving also with a sense of mission, other families and the wider family of society. So maybe after this, some of you would volunteer to go to Iraq. <laughs> Or, uh, <laughs> or go on. Uh, and then there will be another ceremony here where Archbishop Miller will commission families. This family will be sent by the Diocese of Vancouver to da -da! Aleppo. <laughs> oh. And so, wow. Oh. And that strengthens the nuclear family and strengthens also the wider family in faith. Okay. <laughs> Did I leave you with problems or with dilemmas? <laughs> <laughs> so as I said, no, this will not be a, a comprehensive thing. I was just trying to prick your imagination and I was your, 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 your faith imagination and see how fundamental elements of faith, faith that gives us certainty to hope, faith that makes us see gifts, grace, to be cared for. The faith vision where the wounded rises to new life, but in the resurrection, the wounds remain and they become wounds of peace and forgiveness. Then the faith that says, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. 
let me end, really end now, really end now <laughs> with a story. I told this to uh, some people already have told this, but I, th I think it merits uh, a repetition uh, regarding mission and going out of one's uh, nuclear family. Again, this comes from uh, my encounter with people in Lebanon and uh, uh, so I saw how some of the Caritas Lebanon workers and volunteers, how they have become weary and tired. And I was afraid that they might lose their sense of mission, lose their, their perspective of faith as being sent by Jesus because, you know, you can, you can absorb so much negativity and then lose, you know, lose sight of the faith. So I told them, please open your eyes of faith. See signs of hope. See signs of goodness. See signs of the presence of the risen Lord in the situations that you are faced with. And they will encourage you. They will give you new life. And one woman raised her hand, and uh, she said, I have a story to tell. This woman was tasked by Caritas uh, Lebanon to serve illegal migrants, especially those who, who work without uh, documentation permits, and they are put in a detention, detention center. They do not call it a jail. They, they distinguish between a jail for criminals and a detention center for those who, whose uh, uh, documents and permits have expired. But, you know, it's, it's still a detention center. There are, there are bars. And, now, this woman, uh, she even brought me there. Uh, she told us the story. She was invited by Caritas Syria to give a seminar training to uh, some of the volunteers of Caritas Syria on how to minister to illegal migrants. She lived in a convent of sisters, and every day she would take a taxi to the site of the conference. One day, she reached her destination. She asked the driver, how much will I pay you? And the driver said, uh, no need to pay. Uh, she said, I have money. I can pay you. And the driver said, no, no need to pay. She said, but you are working. You need to earn too. And I have money. I can give you. And the man said, no, no need. She panicked. She panicked. She said, oh, what will this man demand of me? So she said she was almost screaming, shouting. She said, tell me, how much do I owe you? I have money to pay you. And the man said, how can I accept money from Caritas? So she, she, she asked, how did you know that I worked for Caritas? The man said, three years ago, I was in prison in Lebanon. I saw you there. The day before I was to be released, I had a terrible headache. But the guards did not give me medicine. You passed by. And I asked you for medicine. You gave me one. And I was able to sleep well that night. But I have not thanked you. So now I want to say thank you. Three years, 
for three years, the face of that woman was embedded in his mind and heart, filled with gratitude. She was a gift. And in his woundedness, peace came through this woman. And now, God allowed their paths to cross after three years in Syria. And what an explosion of love. They were like family. It was the birth of a new family, a new humanity. And it can happen when people go out, go out of their shelves, go out and bring their family to serve. And you will be surprised, even, even on the road, on a, on a road in Syria, a new family could be born. So the woman ended her story by saying, I may be tired, but I will continue serving in Caritas. The sense of mission and her contribution, her contribution to a new family. I will keep my promise. I end here, really end here. Thank you very much for your patience and your understanding. Thank you, thank you. Well, I don't know about you, but my imagination has certainly been tickled. <laughs> First of all, I'd like to give gratitude and thank His Grace, Archbishop Miller, for bringing us this wonderful gift. As I listened to you, Your Eminence, I thought of my own experiences in Caritas and my work in Caritas and the joy it gave me. And I also have to say that, you know, often we look at problems as problems and the need for solutions, but when we understand them as dilemmas, it's a very different thing. I also have to say that, you know, you truly are the pastor for all of us uh, in your job and in your work as president of the Catholic Bible Federation and also as president of Caritas Internationalis. The understanding of the Word of God, the Bible, in action of good works in faith, you bring that together so well. And through <laughs> and yes, you've made us laugh because we did see ourselves in many of those stories that you told. <laughs> Even those of us who are celibates will have to go home and think about the gifts of God that we have in our lives, our parishioners. <laughs> and truly, Tonight, you have been an inspiration to so many of us. You are truly the pastor to the Philippines, to the Filipino people throughout the world. And today, I think, and today, I think even those of us who are Ukrainian feel <laughs> Filipino. Your Eminence, thank you so much for the gift that you have given us this evening. I'm sure that all of us here will want to go out and tell stories, our story, about how we have experienced this wonderful gift. 
and uh, the impact that your presence with us today at Mass at Holy Rosary Cathedral and your presence with us in the wonderful Church of Vancouver headed by our Archbishop Michael Miller. We want to thank you. We want to assure you of our prayers for you and for all of the faithful in Manila and in the Philippines. I think that it would be most fitting, Your Eminence, if we could pray with you together now before we leave and ask for your blessings as our Father as well. If we could pray the Our Father and the Hail Mary for the intentions of His Eminence and for Archbishop Miller and then ask for His Eminence's blessings upon us. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, and that was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Maybe the three bishops could give the blessing. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord let his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Amen. May the Lord look upon you kindly and grant you peace. Amen. And may the choicest blessings of Almighty God descend upon you, your loved ones, your families, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you.